is slow, casual, relaxed. The left's always in a hurry. And there are two ways of doing something about this. You can either persuade the right brain to go faster, for example, in discos with throbbing music and so on, <clears throat> you know, African tom-toms and all this kind of thing. So you gradually get more and more excited and suddenly the right brain's going as fast as the left. Or you can do the opposite. You can go into sort of transcendental meditation, you can relax, you can listen to classical music and suddenly begin to get this feeling that, you know, the whole world is opening up then the left is slowed down to the pace of the right. The right is, has no sense of time. My wife, for example, is a typical right brain. She's always late. And, you know, this is one of the prices I pay for the fact that she's extremely sweet and good-tempered. And the human race is exactly like this. We're paying a price for our left brain concentration and intensity. But now we arrive at the absurdity. We have created civilization simply with the aim of getting rid of dangers and inconveniences. We don't like being eaten by saber-toothed tigers and so on. So we quite deliberately created civilization. We all got together and then little by little, because we made this extraordinary discovery that when you lose, use the left brain on its own, it does quite astonishing things that the two halves of the brain don't really do very well together. When the two halves are together, you know, as when you're slightly drunk, you don't really care. I mean, who, for example, would do anything as boring as mathematics when they're slightly drunk? Or, you know, work out some interesting, complicated problem. You just want to relax. It's when you're bored and you concentrate your left brain that suddenly you begin to do these things. Human beings suddenly develop science, mathematics, philosophy by becoming left-brainers. This has shot us forward <clears throat> at a tremendous rate. It's created our civilization in a mere 3,000 years. Nothing, nothing whatever, because we're still basically cavemen. We've shot forward at this enormous speed because somehow, quite accidentally, we've discovered this accelerative force of the left brain. And now we face the problem. Here we are in this lovely civilization we've created. If a caveman could now see us, he'd say, my God, they must all be in ecstasy. What a wonderful life. You know, being at La Trobe University and listening to Colin Wilson. Can you think? <laughs> and the strange thing about it is that we are trapped in the present, in a kind of boredom. We cannot appreciate these things. When I was young, one of the fairy stories that fascinated me was that story about the old woman in the vinny bottle. You know, the fairy goes flying past and she hears a voice saying, Oh dear, oh dear. And she finds a little old woman in a vinegar bottle and uh, she says, What are you crying about? And the old woman says, Well, wouldn't you cry if you had to live in a vinegar bottle? So the fairy ra waves her magic wand and turns into a lovely little cottage. And the next time she flies past, the old woman's going, Oh dear, oh dear. And, you know, she, the well's too far away at the bottom of the garden, it's cold, so she waves it, turns into a lovely little house. The next time she goes past, oh dear, oh dear, you know, the place is just a little too inconvenient. So she turns into a palace, and next time the old woman's still groaning, oh dear, oh dear. And, um, you know, this time she says, what's wrong? She says, oh, the servants are all dishonest, and the place is too big and cold and all the rest, so she turns it back into a vinegar bottle. Now, that story always impressed me deeply, because it's what's wrong with all of us. We're all old women in the vinegar bottle. You see, when I pick up any sort of modern philosopher or attend any sort of lecture in the literary department of a modern university, I hear people going, oh dear, oh dear, <laughs> and obviously feeling that... <coughs> <coughs> we spent 3,000 years building this beautiful civilization and we're still moaning, oh dear, oh dear, because we are trapped in the left half of the brain. Now this is an absurdity. The Modern civilization was created to get rid of dangers and inconveniences. 
You know, G.K. Chesterton once said, an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly considered. An inconvenience is only an adventure wrongly considered. And Whitehead also said, civilization cannot live without adventure. And there you have the basic problem. We've created civilization to get rid of inconvenience, and we've also got rid of adventure. And yet, in a certain sense, this is not basically true. The trouble is simply we've trapped ourselves in one half of the brain. And Maslow's question, how could you have the peak experience at will, is obviously the basic answer to the question that has been, as it were, creeping up on mankind for the past six million years. You can see that in a sense we already have the answer. We've already created the answer through the history of civilization. What we have done is to build up a microscope that can focus very precisely upon anything. We also have what you might call a telescope, which can take a bird's eye view of things and which operates when we're in moods of deep relaxation, which we get into with these inventions like the opera, the novel, the symphony. We're deliberately trying our best to get away from this being trapped. That's, that's what the invention of the novel and the drama and later, you know, music and opera and so on was all about. We're doing our best instinctively to do it, but we don't quite yet know consciously how to do it. You could say, well, let's learn once again to open our minds, to sort of look, as it were, from help from outside, from the universe itself. Let's learn to relax like cows. There's no point whatever in that. Nietzsche once said, I feel like asking the cows the secret of their happiness, but it's no good because they've forgotten the question before they can give the answer. <laughs> we fortunately have the power to retain the question, and that is far more important than any sense of universal goodness. We must cling to the intensity of the left brain, but we must learn to control it by the left brain. I know that sounds a total absurdity, but it's not. It's the fundamental answer. About five years ago, I got a letter from an American psychologist called Howard Miller, who told me that he thought he discovered the basic secret of the human mind. He said that studying hypnosis, he had become convinced that what's wrong with our brains is that we possess in the core of the brain an ability to focus precisely upon other times and other places. And he used to do this with his patients. He would say, close your eyes. Imagine that you are in a winter landscape. You can feel the snow crunching under your feet. Uh, you can hear the faint murmur of the wind in trees above your head. All these things um, you can sort of conjure up in your mind. Now change it. You're lying on a hot beach in a completely tropical climate and you're listening to the splash of waves on the beach. And, you know, his patients did this as we all can. And then he would say, look, what in your brain switched you from the winter landscape to the summer landscape? What did it? It was you the essential you, something you do not normally use. I wrote, a st I, I wrote in The Outsider about a story by Hemingway called Soldier's Home, in which a young soldier comes back from the First World War and back in his hometown in Wisconsin feels completely bored and fed up with his ordinary life there. He goes and plays pool in the local hall and Hemingway says he talks about his experiences during the war, experiences which once had made him, when he thought about them, feel cool and clean inside. And suddenly, although he knows they're true, he just somehow no longer believes them. 
he feels almost as if he's telling lies, the opposite of faculty X. Now, he says, those moments in crisis during the war when you did the one thing, the only thing, and it always came out right. That's obviously the answer. Whenever you do the one thing, the only thing, and it always comes out right. Whenever some crisis suddenly presents itself, you see, what Howard Miller was saying is this. Our normal consciousness is passive. We've developed a kind of robot insiders whose purpose is to learn things and then do them better than we could do them consciously. You learn to type painfully key by key. Then your robot takes it over and does it much quicker than you could. You learn French painfully word by word. Then your robot takes it over and, l and talks French. This is marvellous, except your robot also does things you don't want him to do. You listen to a, a, a symphony which moves you deeply, and the tenth time you listen to it, your robot's listening too, and you no longer enjoy it. You go for a, a walk that moves you deeply, or you think isn't this wonderful, the tenth time you do it, your robot's doing the walk for you, and you lo no longer enjoy it. Your robot keeps saying, I've even caught him making love to my wife. <laughs> this <laughs> and this is, this is the basic problem of the robot, which human beings have developed. Now, obviously, the robot disappears as soon as we are deeply interested in something, as soon as we concentrate. And Howard Miller says, it's almost as if, in ordinary consciousness, things get stuck in your mind, like a tune you just can't get rid of, and you think, oh my God, you know, you get this feeling that the mind is, um, is completely uncontrolled by you. And then, one day, it's as if, Suddenly, you're sitting in a cinema watching the most boring film ever on the screen, and what's more, it appears that the projectionist has got the reels all mixed up, it's so confused. And you think, you know, what the hell is the projectionist doing? And then you go up to the projection box, and it's empty. And then suddenly you realize, you are the projectionist, and you've been sitting in the wrong place. That's what it means when Hemingway said those moments when you did the one thing, the only thing under crisis, and it always comes out right. You suddenly become the projectionist because you know you are the projectionist. It's like if you're trying to drive a car from the passenger seat, leaning over to the steering wheel, you drive very badly. Under crisis, you suddenly move into the passenger seat, and suddenly you're driving perfectly because you're now in the right position behind the steering wheel. What I'm saying is we have an essential ego and Howard Miller recognized this. Now, when Howard Miller wrote to me about this, I felt that he was merely saying something that the German philosopher Edmund Husserl had already said. We possess a, possess a kind of transcendental ego which presides above consciousness and which can pull together all our thoughts and feelings. So I wrote back and said, you know, it's all very interesting, but Husserl said it earlier. And he was obviously disappointed. <laughs> and, <laughs> And then, one day, I'd finished my day's work as usual, about three o'clock, and I took my dogs for a walk on the cliff. Now, when I finish my day's work, I'm often very tired, and my brain just, you know, does not seem to take in the beauty of the cliff scenery in Cornwall. And I've discovered that the way to counteract this is to make terrific mental efforts until it hurts. I squeeze my mental powers and if I can do it hard enough until it actually hurts, then quite suddenly the scenery becomes real, and I'm suddenly enjoying my walk. Now, as I was doing this on this particular day, making these terrific mental efforts, and suddenly everything became real and I was enjoying my walk, I thought, ha-ha, how did I do that? What inside me did it? And I thought, well, I didn't know, it was just me. It was just Colin Wilson. And I thought, oh, no, 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 that can't be true. You know, we all know that the ordinary conscious ego um, is uh, uh, at the top of consciousness, a sort of mere superficial layer. We all know from D.H. Lawrence and Henry Miller and Walt Whitman that, you know, it's the instincts, it's the solar plexus that are the really important part of us. And that's what Maslow meant when he said you can't create the peak experience at will. And then I thought, nope. Nope, it was me. It was just me, the ordinary Colin Wilson, who did it. I did it by concentrating very hard. Me. Then suddenly it hit me. 
I thought, Christ, Howard Miller's right. And I rushed home and I wrote him a letter saying, do you realize you're the greatest psychologist since Freud? <laughs> this is a terrific discovery. We do possess a central ego. And we are sitting in the passenger seat instead of the driving seat. And as soon as we realize this and make this mental effort, which is, is what I was doing instinctively without understanding it, the answer suddenly begins to appear. And it's that that makes me recognize that at this point in the 20th century, we appear to be on the point of a kind of evolutionary leap. I was saying this when the outsider came up 30 years ago, and yet in a sense, I didn't really believe it. I was saying it abstractly, rationally. Now I know it to be true because I can see it. People like Howard Miller and Arthur Kerstler and Michael Polanyi and Karl Popper and Abraham Maslow are all coming to the same recognition from different angles and they're all coming together. We're recognizing we're trapped in one half of the brain, that we're trapped for a reason because that's the way that civilization has developed and that we don't need to be trapped. Here we are in this lovely civilization, we can relax as much as we like because there aren't any saber-toothed tigers around the corner and we can't do it because instinct, because habit over the past 10,000 years or so has accustomed us to sitting around in a state of tension. We can't tell ourselves that, you know, okay, you can let go. Now's the time to let go. Now, just one more point before I finish. I appear to be saying that the answer is to go back to the right brain, to relaxation. But you can see from everything I've been saying that that is not the answer. I'm not talking about the right brain and going back to the right brain. I'm not talking about going back to instinctive female consciousness. I'm talking about the meshing together of the two halves of the brain. I'm not talking about a return to occult faculties, although they incidentally appear to be an automatic consequence of this widening of consciousness I'm speaking of. I'm speaking simply about the union of the two halves of the brain. I'm talking, in fact, about faculty X. We're not going backwards into the past, back to the animal stage. This power we possess of suddenly grasping the reality of other times and other places is faculty X and we all have it. You know, I loathe and detest travel. I've always hated it. I'm a typical cancer. I love my home. And cons the consequence is that in previous lecture trips in America and so on, long before the end of the trip, I've loathed the whole bloody thing. And I've got home completely accident prone and we're on the point of a nervous breakdown because I can't stand it. Before I set out on this trip, I thought, now is your chance to prove your point. If Faculty X exists, prove it on this trip by not getting sick of lecturing and seeing places, because, you know, one place is just like another. <laughs> and in point of fact, you know, I've proved it to myself. I've succeeded on this trip for the first time in utilizing what I've actually been saying now, of pulling myself together to such an extent that I haven't drifted into this state of feeling, oh God, you know, I wish I was back home again. You know, in fact, I'm enjoying Australia so much, I feel I can settle here. And I recognize that this is the point at which everybody has got to apply this. It's not an abstract thing that I'm talking about. It's a personal thing for everybody with every single problem you've got at this moment. You apply this totally personally. And it's the moment you recognize that what I'm saying is a strong enough lever to overturn any personal problem that you suddenly recognize that we do possess this peculiar mental power to recreate ourselves. And I think I better shut up at that point. Colin is prepared to answer questions whether they come from the left half of your brain or the right half. <laughs> Are there questions? 
Would anybody have the stamina to go on any longer? <laughs> well, may I ask a question? What, what is there in uh, concentrating, in the technique of concentrating in the way uh, you have recommended uh, that an individual needs to do? Is it just a matter of making up one's mind and concentrating? Now, you see, for me, although concentration is obviously of terrific importance, you can see when I was walking on the cliff that day with my dogs, I was doing it, I knew what to do. I knew that the answer was the scenery wasn't real to me. What I had to do was to concentrate. You know, this story which I keep on telling about how Graham Greene played Russian roulette with his brother's revolver, that he was feeling totally low and bored and depressed, that he took this revolver out onto Berkhamsted Common, inserted one bullet in the chambers, spun the chamber, pointed it at his head and pulled the trigger. And when there was just a click, he looked down the barrel and saw the bullet had now come into position and experienced this tremendous feeling of overwhelming happiness and the feeling that the world is a wonderful place. <laughs> well, that is the basic trick, if you like, and that is what I was doing walking on the cliff. I was feeling low, depressed. I was feeling, you know, the scenery wasn't real. So what I was doing was concentrating until it hurt. By the way, that's the important point, until it hurts. Don't, don't be afraid of, as it were, hurting the inside of the brain. That's, that's the answer to it. And I was doing this instinctively, but the point was that when I suddenly thought, why did that work? Then I began to think, about the reasons behind it. And then I began to see the implications, and you can see that the knowledge, the implications, were far more important than the trick itself. Once you have the knowledge, and once you understand the implications, you can do it from any number of angles, so to speak. Otherwise, you just do it instinctively, like a dog jumping through a hoop. What I'm talking about is a knowledge system. I'm talking about understanding ourselves. See, Gurdjieff had this method of trying to wake people up. What he used to do was, for example, to walk into the room in the middle of the night and snap his fingers, and all his pupils had to be out of bed and in some sort of complicated position within two seconds. Well, this was obviously a very good way of keeping them alert. And in this way, he thought he kept them way above the normal standard of what he called sleep. And this is true. These methods will indeed keep people alert. Gurdjieff called it alarm clocks. But all these methods, merely developing the will, unless they have conscious purpose and knowledge behind them, are merely tricks. I spent a weekend at the school of one of Gurdjieff's pupils, J.G. Bennett, at Sherborne, and I watched them doing these incredibly complicated dances. I've never seen anything like it. They tried to teach me and a few others how to do it. You know how if you try and rub your tummy with one hand and pat your head with the other, you can't do it, you start doing the same thing with both hands? Well, in Gurdjieff's dances, you do different things with both hands and different things with both feet and different things with your head all at the same time. And there they were doing these beautiful, graceful dances looking like peculiar puppets, robots, you know, except they were graceful. And Gurdjieff was trying to liberate the moving centre, as he called it, from its mechanicalness. And I said to one of Bennett's pupils who'd been with him for 20 years, you do all this beautifully, um, does this actually give you a feeling of freedom? And he said, oh no, you get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it's the knowledge that's more important, you see, than the concentration. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yes. Um, I've been reading something this year about a uh, buyer, a chap called Krishnamurti, you've probably heard of him, um, he talks about um, the style of mind and uh, I think that's probably something exactly what probably sort of like it. And his main theme seems to be that to achieve that state or to come into that state, um, uh, you'll, you'll never get there if you're um, trying to achieve something or aiming at it. And, and it seems to imply that he's been a 
he has his silent mind for most of his life where he seems to, he's telling us what it's like and trying to get us all into that state and the only way you could do it was by not aiming at some end but by getting everything out of the way and it's the opposite of that. Mm. That's, I just wonder when you talk about um, straining almost to, to achieve the end and uh, whether I mean, what you have to say about what he said then by uh, actually only being able to do it by not aiming at it. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I see your point very much. You can see that Krishnamurti was doing it by the right brain way. But also, inter interestingly enough, Krishnamurti's original inspiration was this recognition that we, uh, we possess a controlling ego, a central self. And Krishnamurti said, once you've discovered this central self, instead of wandering around in circles and doing completely contradictory things, we suddenly begin to control everything by it. And that was his central point. But this notion, you can see, was Maslow's notion also, where Maslow said to me, nope, it, the peak experience comes when it wants to, and it goes when it wants to, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, as you know, the Viennese psychologist Viktor Frankl discovered rather an interesting way of applying this. Um, he discovered what he called the law of reverse effort. He went to a school play before the war where he noticed that somebody in the school play was a stutterer and was asked to play the part of a stutterer. And as soon as he began to try to play the part of a stutterer, he couldn't stutter for the life of him. <laughs> Maslow, be uh, sorry, Frankel began to apply this principle to his patients. So, for example, he got one uh, Jewish clerk, and in these days, bank clerks had to write by hand. And because he was Jewish, he was worried about being in Vienna and the Nazis, and his handwriting was getting worse and worse. And he was convinced he would lose his job. So he went to see Frankel, and Frankel said, look, go home, take a pen, say to yourself, I'm going to develop the worst handwriting in the whole world, and write as badly as you possibly can. The man wrote badly for a half an hour, and then found that he couldn't write badly anymore. This effort to write badly, to reverse the whole process, had in fact relaxed him completely. And of course, Frankel then went on to make these terrific discoveries during the war that appear to me to be the most important thing of the 20th century in a way. Do you remember that what happened was that Frankel was among a lot of Jews um, who were taken to Auschwitz and they, they were moved from Auschwitz to Dachau and they were moved on a train that took two days and when they got there some of the prisoners had fallen asleep in the lavatory so that when they were counted um, they weren't on the list and their captors got very annoyed and made them stand outside Dachau <coughs> for the whole of the night and part of the following morning in freezing cold and they'd had nothing to eat for two days and yet he said they were all nudging one another and laughing because Dachau had no chimney and this one fact in itself was enough to give them a future and to make the discomfort unimportant. In other words, the human mind has this weird capacity, once it has a future, a purpose of any sort, to throw off these curious trivialities. Now, it's much more so for all of us in everyday life, with the problem of the old woman in the vinegar bottle. The problem becomes intensified, and any kind of purpose, any kind of drive, well, instantly, as it were, throw off the neuroses in the way that snow shoots off the bonnet of a car as soon as you begin to drive fast. This is the main problem with human beings. Maslow recognized we stand still too much of the time. The robot makes us sit passively when we should be moving. This is okay for animals because that's what they're supposed to do. An animal with, faced with no problem will simply lie still or sit in a field or look around vaguely for food or whatever. Human beings are the only creature who realize that when you stand still, it can be the most important time of your life. I've just returned from Japan, where I was at the celebrations of an 8th eight, century Buddhist saint called Kukai, who had gone out into the forest at the age of 19 and just sat there. Why should he sit there? What an absurd thing to do, to sit on the edge of a crag in the forest. Because he knew that when human beings sit still, we have this odd capacity to do something with the inside of the mind. And that this is what the mind was intended for. And it took another eight centuries before Samuel Richardson came along and suddenly began to develop new ways.
ways of sitting still and doing something with the inside of the mind. That's what we're all about. Sitting still and exploring inner worlds. That's the key to what human beings are. Access to inner worlds, the Aladdin's cave. <coughs> The last words, so all these final words that we must talk about it. And to some extent, Colin Wilson has just answered my thoughts. But I will add that these thoughts were about the importance of relax relaxing and being still, which you were bringing out. That I think I can use, because concentration seems sometimes to me to be a paralyzing dead end little thing, I like the word energize, that while you are still and opening up in quietness, there is an opportunity for you to energize all your senses. And I hope that is a little piece of partly what you were helping to tell us. No, I've recognized, you know, for a long time, because my wife, as I say, is a total right-brainer, that males and females do appear to have two totally different ways. And they can do it quite differently. Now, I, if I relax deeply when I come back from my walk on the cliff and try to put myself into this wide-open state, first of all, I get an exquisite sensation of other times and other places. Even on this trip around... Japan and Australia, I can, if I relax, suddenly remember with tremendous vividness, not oddly enough Goran Haven where I live, but Amsterdam and Paris and Stockholm and other places where I've been, because the strangeness of this place, for me, evokes other strange places and I can suddenly be in them like Proust. But I find that when I try to do this, particularly if I try to do this in my room um, back at Richard Luke's, I tend to fall asleep. Um, obviously, you know, this isn't my way. My way is the way of concentration. Um, women appear to have a completely different way, which at the moment I don't fully understand, and which, you know, I would like to explore. Yes. Um, relating to your central self, one who perhaps suggest is there another vinegar bottle out of which it seems to me we are led if we go in the direction of the balance of the right and left as I've understood you through your writings to be speaking. <coughs> because an outcome of that for me is a suggestion that the self as currently developed is locked in a, in a very cut off individual atomized state and that once one is released into the other mode that you're describing, a part of the outcome of that is, a, is what one might call an interflow or, a, or an enhanced creative communication between human beings so that the nature of the self ceases to seem so much cut off in a vinegar bottle. And I think Husserl never got that far and Melo Ponti with his consummate reciprocity was after that sort of thing. Do you find that it, it accentuates qualities of communication in human beings that might reverse our somewhat destructive treatment of each other? Well, yes. yes, yes indeed, very much. But I notice you use the interesting phrase, balance, between the right and the left. And I think this is a fairly important point. You often discover a married couple who are perfectly balanced and who complement one another and yet are in a certain sense a completely stagnant marriage. They get on perfectly and they, you know, sort of die and they're buried together, but nothing much happens. <laughs> and there's something far more important than the question of mere balance between the right and left, and that, as I say, is this effort like two lumberjacks at either end of a double-handled saw actually working together? Um, I discover that this is actually what happens to me if I can get into these states, what I'm doing is ten times as much work as I normally do. If I try to use the saw on my own, as I often do early in the morning when I first go down to my desk, my left brain's awake and off I go. 
and try to work away and the first half page or page is terrifically difficult because there's just me sitting handling the saw and then with a little luck after half an hour I feel somebody take hold of the other end of the saw and start to work with me and as soon as that happens I give a sigh of relief and relax and suddenly there is this working relationship between the two halves in which both so to speak are learning from one another and developing and this also seems to me incidentally to be a picture of what the relationship between man and woman should be and which it isn't in animals one more question um, in your discussion about trying to combine or bring to harmony the left and right mind I, see, I seem to see some resemblance between the way you describe it and some, some form of yoga philosophy in practice. I just wonder what exactly is your relation to yoga? And secondly, in your discussion or in your talk about the evolution of humankind, you, it seemed to be a very Eurocentric one. I just wondered in the, you have any further thoughts on the Eastern civilization and their contribution to human, human evolution? So there are two questions there. Um, as I say, I've, I've just sort of returned from Japan and the reason I was asked to go to Japan was obviously because a lot of my work deals with Eastern philosophy and the fact that I started off in my teens deeply influenced by Hinduism and Buddhism. I ceased to be a Buddhist uh, in my early twenties because I felt Buddha was basically pessimistic. I'm assured that he's not. And in fact, I came across a passage that Howard showed me the other day in which I saw this explained with beautiful precision and then I realized I'd written it myself 20 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, the fact remains that Buddha nevertheless tends to believe that the, the world is a sort of bad place and we have to detach ourselves from it and learn not to allow our desires to get tangled in it. But my outlook was always more optimistic. Um, so at a moderately early stage I detached myself from Eastern philosophy and began pursuing, which as you rightly say, is the Eurocentric way. Uh, I've continued to do this while my wife, in fact, goes to yoga classes every Wednesday. And she's been doing this for the past five years. She apparently has a very good yoga teacher. You wouldn't believe it, but Cornwall is full of yoga teachers. You know, we are, and when The Outsider came out in 1956, this was unheard of. You know, it suddenly happened. It's interesting to watch the way these great changes happen quite suddenly. And as I say, my wife goes to yoga classes and tells me a little about her exercises. And periodically I start to tell her about some new insight I've had. And she says, ah, oh, yes, my yoga teacher said that. But what she says is never quite the same as what I've said. We're obviously approaching the thing from totally different angles and seeing the same landmarks now and then. And I think on the whole, um, what I'm trying to develop with my notion of faculty X is a completely Western way of developing these things. So far all that the West has added to philosophy has been a kind of driving materialism and a certain intellectualism which as I say has been a bad thing. You can see that what I'm trying to do is to create a counterbalance to this, a kind of holistic philosophy recognizing both sides of the mind and yet at the same time attempting to bring everything together once again. In other words, ideally if somebody could do it, if some Isaac Newton of philosophy could rise up and create a great synthesis, it would be a total synthesis of European and Oriental philosophy. They've been called everything from messiahs of the milk bars to the new intellectuals. Who are these angry young men? What have they in common, if anything? A number of them have set down their credos or their attitudes to life in a book called Declaration, 